Well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight, for this afternoon. Um, it, I, it's a great pleasure that I introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. James Howard Chip, who hails from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he is the distinguished James Howard Professor. I'm not sure how you, you have your name in the in the endowed professorship, but that's an interesting. Well, that'll be a story in and of itself. A story in and of itself. Uh, but you notice I don't use it. Yes, I notice that you don't. Um, and he did his. He went to medical medical school, at University of Vermont. He did went. He did his residency in University of Virginia. He trained under such illustrious neuromuscular neurologists as Donald Sanders and and, and Eric Stahlberg. And he has a, a principal focus on myasthenia gravis. He's published, oh gosh, I couldn't even count the number of publications, well over 130, 40 publications, peer-reviewed publications, similar numbers of presentations at a number of national meetings. Uh, he sits on the examination committee for the American Board of Electrodiagnostic Medicine with me and is on the board itself. And um, I know a few, I've known Chip for a number of years, so I know a little bit about him that maybe other people don't know. He's an avid glass blower, and last night we went to Chihuly exhibit and had a great time. He is a, a sailor, and I think at one point you were a ski instructor. Is that right? But to, but he's going to talk about his other academic passion, which is uh, myasthenia gravis, and specifically the role of complement in myasthenia gravis. Thanks very much, Chip. Thank you, Michael. Does that sound okay? Thanks to Jane and Leo and Mike for the invitation. My wife says my hobbies are too expensive. <laughs> but be that as it may. Oh, Chip, I'm so sorry. I forgot to say this is from an a unrestricted educational grant from Walgreens. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I know I had worked that in somewhere. Sorry, Chip. So we're going to talk about complement in the role in myasthenia gravis. And complement on a number of fronts has become a real buzzword. Um, and its role is being elucidated um, not so much from a, a uh, basic science perspective, because we know a lot about it, but from a therapeutic strategy. And I'll tell you why that's occurred. My record disclosures are here. I do serve as a consultant to Alexion, and we're going to be talking about their drug later. But I do it out of the goodness of my heart, and I'm not paid for it, so I stay out of the Sunshine Act. Um, so we've known for a long time that membrane at the neuromuscular junction is destroyed in myasthenia. And if one looks at a normal end plate, and to orient you, this is the nerve terminal. These are synaptic vesicles here. Here's muscle membrane with the highly organized postjunctional folds that occur. And one sees the synaptic cleft in between. And to compare that to uh, someone with myasthenia gravis, one finds that the nerve terminal remains intact, but the postjunctional region has been destroyed. And for a long time, the question was, what is its role and, and why? Um, Andy Engel, back in the 70s, uh, was the first to make these observations and give us insight as to what was going on through some very elegant work that we'll highlight on. But let's step back just a minute and try and understand what blocks synaptic transmission in myasthenia. Um, and there are more than one way uh, to skin a cat, if you will. And so one way is that we have antibody binding to a variety of determinants uh, of the acetylcholine receptor complex. The vast majority of them do not bind to the transmitter binding site, but bind to some other epitope. And because of the size of the molecule, and because they cross-link, they then sterically hinder transmitter getting to the binding site. 
There are antibodies that bind directly to the binding site, and they too block um, synaptic transmission. There are two receptor sites on each, there are two binding sites on each receptor, and both must be occupied in order for that ionic channel to open. If one or none are out of commission, or one or both, then the channel can't open. And given this is a dynamic process, uh, the more receptors we lose, our safety margin for synaptic transmission falls, and then we end up with synaptic failure. The other way we mess this all up is that binding of antibody and subsequent cross-linking of that antibody increases the natural degradation cycle of the receptor. Receptors turn over about every eight days. So old ones get internalized, chewed up, repurposed for parts, new ones get pushed up to the surface. And this process becomes accelerated, so we're in a net loss uh, of receptors available for transmitter. Engel, back in the 70s, began to notice when we were in the 70s is when we started working with the experimental model, EAMG. We could immunize with purified receptor protein and recreate this disease in rabbits and mice and rats. Um, and he be noted with his work that immunoglobulin was bound to the post-junctional membrane, presumably to receptor, uh, it co-localized with Bunger toxin, which bound directly to the receptor. But then in the terminal debris here, after it had been chewed up, he was able to stain for C9 complement, and it lit up like a Christmas tree. And so back in the mid-70s, we already knew that there was some role for complement uh, in all of this. The other way that we block synaptic transmission is to destroy membrane that I showed you in the first slide. And so with binding of antibody uh, to the receptor complex, there is cross-linking, and that induces the activation of complement. And then complement goes down its tree and generates MAC, or the membrane attack complex, which then goes and drills holes in the membrane and functionally destroys it. And that accounts for the post-junctional simplification uh, that we see. And so the synaptic cleft widens. There's greater diffusion of transmitter out of here, less probability of transmitter binding to receptor sites, and that too impairs synaptic transmission. So there's a multitude of mechanisms that are capable of impairing nerve muscle communication. And here again, a normal post-junctional fold. Here's our nerve terminal. One doesn't see the synaptic cleft well, but it's right in here on the top. Here is a myasthenic neuromuscular junction. And one sees this architectural reorganization abutting the destruction, which is all related uh, to complement. We know through immunocytochemistry that complement and antibody and bunger toxin co-localize through some of this work here by Tuzin. And so if we look at the binding of bunger toxin specific for the acetylcholine receptor with IgG antibody, there's co-localization. If we look at bunger toxin co-localizing with C3, one sees that it does co-localize. If we look at C1Q, there is co-localization. And here's MAC, the membrane attack complex, co-localizing with receptors. So very good uh, data that came out in the mid-2000s uh, that further solidified the understanding uh, that complement was indeed playing a role here at the neuromuscular junction. My research project as a resident was to passively transfer human disease to a Lewis rat and look at the developing neuromuscular blockade, uh, which I did in 76 and 77, 78, and then never got around to publishing it till the 80s. Uh, but be that as it may, if we blocked 
animals with who have been immunized with cobra venom factor, which blocks the action of complement, we could prevent the induction of experimental myasthenia. Van de Lennon at Mayo Clinic was able to do the same thing uh, here, and here are rats here being immunized with receptor protein, and clinically three quarters were sick. Similarly, they had a decrement to repetitive stimulation. Uh, they saw inflammatory changes, and they were able to measure reduced amounts of receptor complex from extracted muscle. If they just simply gave the animal adjuvant, um, there was no abnormality seen. If they immunized with receptor protein and cobra venom factor, uh, only one of the six animals got sick. None had decrements. Um, and receptor um, uh, extraction uh, was, uh, was normal. And from a clinical perspective, if they looked at the weight of the animal who was immunized, uh, one saw a progressive steady decline that didn't occur if you block the action of complement uh, in these immunized animals. So another good piece of data uh, stating that complement was indeed playing a role. So this is the complement cascade. We all learned about it in medical school, and we've forgotten more than we learned about it at the time. Um, and much of this we are not interested in today. We're going to only be interested in this part right here. From the activation of C5, and then the binding of C5B with 6, 7, 8, and 9 to form the membrane attack complex, because this is what destroys tissue, uh, this component here. So people began to say, if I could selectively target complement inhibition, preserve good components for optimization and for the tick over pathway, etc., could I selectively knock out that which led to the development of the membrane attack complex? And so people looked at C6 and developed a monoclonal antibody to animals, um, uh, experimental myasthenic mice. Uh, here are rats, and one sees that these animals became weak, uh, could not stand on their limbs. They had decremental responses to repetitive stimulation in contrast to the control uh, group. And as a measure, when people use these as total body weight, um, the experimental induced animals had rapid a decline in body weight. Those treated with C6, anti-C6, preserved body weight and grew and didn't have the abnormalities that we spoke about. If we targeted C5, one also found that they could prevent the induction of experimental myasthenia. And so here are genetically deficient animals with C5 complement and the vast majority of them survive. Um, here, the vast majority of those that are not deficient in C5 develop fairly progressive weakness and ultimate timely death uh, here, as shown in this, uh, this bottom picture. And again, further solidifying uh, the data. Um, people decided, well, let's knock out C5A and again taking it down the pathway of where can we involve or intercede and knocking out C5A did not prevent the development of experimental myasthenia. And if we go back and look, here's the arm for C5A. And it's dealing with cell activation chemotaxis. And so taking this out, we'd expect, knowing what we know now, that it would not inhibit the development of the membrane attack complex and disease should persist and continue on. And then people looked at the assembly of C3BBB, uh, which is on the pathway um, uh, into developing or activating C5 um, by knocking out 
CD55, the de decay accelerating factor, and these animals too, and I'll show you where that, uh, and C5, uh, and DAF prevents the, the assembly of C3BB here, C5 convertase, which is necessary to move from C5 to 5B and initiate the formation of, of MAC, the membrane attack complex. And so by taking that out, uh, one could intercede uh, as well. We've known in the human arena that there's been weak correlations of complement in myasthenia. <clears throat> and so individuals who had uh, levels of C3, they had lower QMG scores uh, in several patients, and it was all pretty weak, and we really didn't know um, really what it meant. And this is as late as um, the mid-2000s. Um, we know that our following that directed C5 monoclonal antibodies blocked the development of experimental myasthenia. Here um, is one who is sick. Here is treatment with anti-C5 and looking at it an arbitrary clinical scoring system. Um, here again, one shows that induction and co-treating with anti-C5 block the development of the experimental model, zero being normal. Looking at co-localization, and this doesn't show well, but just accept the fact that bunker toxin binding and C9 co-localized and it was much less with the use of an anti-C5 uh, inhibitor um, here in this panel. And the wild type clearly had no C9 or MAC, um, but bunker toxin would bind as expected to the receptor complex. And from a clinical perspective, uh, these animals had greater weight gain, their weakness was less, uh, et cetera, compared to those who were immunized uh, without receiving this monoclonal antibody. And so two folks at Yale, um, immunologists, developed a humanized monoclonal antibody uh, to C5, um, and uh, it's just depicted here. Um, and it's a mouse backbone to which they've humanized um, the FC receptor complex and started treating patients who had HUS and uh, proximal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, and these individuals had dramatic life-saving results. So back in 2006, we began discussions with the company as to whether this would have a role in myasthenia. And remember, this antibody that was developed, um, the target is right there and again, knocking out uh, the membrane attack complex. And so 2007, eight, well, later than that, 2008, 9, 10, John Kissel and I had lengthy discussions with uh, the company, and we put together a pilot study. It was the company's idea. Originally, they approached us. And all they were interested in was, is there a signal that we could use to tell us whether or not we should move forward with the development of this product as it applies to myasthenia gravis? And so we created a double-blind placebo-controlled study uh, with a very small number of patients. Um, because of the cost of this drug, we had to establish a niche where it might be useful, and we chose patients who had refractory disease, defined as failing two immunomodulatory therapies uh, and whose quality of life uh, was bad. And we had metrics that determined what was bad. Um, there were, these were the studies, I guess you folks weren't involved for this one, uh, you are with our new one, um, and enrollment uh, began. And so the goal was to establish a safety uh, information and also uh, a signal 
We've talked about that. We screened for two to four weeks. There was a 16-week treatment period intravenously administered. We then washed out for five weeks, and then we crossed them over to the other arm. So they were randomized to either placebo or drug and went through treatment period one, wash out, and then those on placebo got drug, those on drug got placebo. Um, and then we looked at their responses. There was an induction dose given for a month on a weekly basis, and then every two week maintenance doses. We screened a number of patients. We were only able to accrue 14. Uh, the target was 21 um, because of the stringency of the entry criteria. Um, 11 completed. Uh, two were dropped because we terminated the study early and one because of lack of efficacy. And so here's the paradigm. So screening, the standard of care, they could not receive IVIG or plasma exchange uh, within several months. I think it was six months prior to, to screening, which was a limiting factor. They were then randomized to one or the other, induction versus maintenance therapy, and then crossed over and then receiving the other, uh, the other drug. This becomes an important aspect, and we'll come back to this. Our primary endpoints were safety, so adverse events. And then we used what's called the QMG score, the Quantified Myasthenia Gravis Score, a 30-point scoring system based on severity of illness. Lower is better, higher is bad. And we used a three-point change, which had been validated previously as the metric uh, for effect. We had a number of secondary endpoints that I've listed here. Um, we'll call attention to the MGADL score because that's what the FDA has mandated we use this time around. And then we had some exploratory endpoints. Our inclusion criteria were that they had to have generalized refractory disease. They had to have antibodies to the receptor and they could only be classes 2 through 4A, so they could not be restricted ocular disease, and they could not have uh, severe bulbar disease or respiratory failure. They had to have had a QMG score that was quite modest, greater than 12, and they had to have a score of 2, it's created 0, 1, 2, and 3. They had to have a score of equal or greater than 2 in 4 of the test items. So this became a very tough, uh, uh, tough uh, program to, to schedule for, to recruit for. Um, and then they had to be treatment failures. And then they couldn't have thymoma, they couldn't have surgery within 12 months, thymectomy, um, and I'll let you read it here. So our baseline demographics were quite similar between men and women. Um, they had a, a broad range of disease activity. Their median score on the QMG was 18, as high as 36. Um, and here are their concomitant therapies. So this is a busy slide. What I'm going to show you first are those individuals um, receiving one arm, their washout, and then crossing over and then I'll show you those who received the other arm first. And so red is active drug, blue is placebo. This dotted line here represents a three-point change in the QMG score. And so here's the first arm in which patients were randomized to active drug initially. Uh, one sees a rapid decline uh, in their QMG score, lower is better. Uh, and then they're washed out, and then they're crossed over uh, to the placebo arm of the trial. What took us by surprise when we analyzed the data was that these people did not come back quickly. They stayed improved for a very prolonged period of time, uh, almost uh, 45 weeks out there for some of them. If we look at those who get placebo first, one sees that there is some bounce, 
Um, they don't reach a three-point change in QMG. They're then administered active drug, and again, a very rapid decline uh, in the QMG score with improved clinical state uh, through the termination uh, of their enrollment. And so 86% of the patients who received this had at least three or more of drop in their QMG score, uh, although the, that in the placebo arm was not inconsequential, 57%. Um, four of the seven who got Aculizumab, active drug, had at least an eight-point reduction in their QMG score versus only 14% in the placebo arm. And what is even interesting is that much of this occurred within the first three weeks of therapy. So within three doses, uh, they're achieving clinical significance. Because of this long crossover effect that we saw back here, uh, this persistent effect, uh, one really couldn't analyze the second treatment arm independently. And that data had to be lumped in. Um, so if we look at the speed with which it works, it's shown here. And the majority of individuals within two weeks are reaching marked improvement. And then it carries out. If we look at those who had substantial improvement, more than or equal to an eight-point reduction, 57% of the population, um, when we're only looking for a three-point reduction, as significant. So fairly robust response uh, to the administration of this monoclonal antibody. When we looked at activities of daily living, and this is a scoring system, do you have ptosis, yes or no? Yes, does it occur daily or not daily? Daily, is it constant or not constant? Constant, when they get a score. And there are a whole series of questions that pertain to double vision, ptosis, chewing, swallowing, talking, breathing, using their arms over the level of their shoulder and getting out of a chair. Um, and so people had a substantial improvement and a two-point change has been validated as significant, um, a substantial or a significant number um, had a four-point change in their, their ADL scores. So uh, were these people taken for pregnostigmine? Pregnostigmine was held 12 hours prior to each assessment. So they were not on it at the time of, of evaluation, but could be on it in between times. Um, so significant differences here and um, was quite gratifying. If we look at QMG and change in, in ADL scores there, um, and here are these individuals with marked changes, many as 15, which is substantial, and significant changes in their ADL score. The FDA mandated the QMG scores to be the primary endpoint in this pilot trial. They flipped on us and they mandated that the ADL score now be the primary endpoint for the second trial, which we'll talk about. Adverse events, pretty similar from group to group, um, mostly mild to moderate, rarely severe. We had two experience crisis <coughs> of significant myasthenic exacerbation. These were during the washout phase when they're not getting drug. It was during their second treatment arm of placebo. Uh, no one on active drug had any acute worsening of their disease. So pretty much a wash. One of the problems is because this inhibits um, C5, uh, capsular uh, bacterium are a risk, Neisseria, and so one has to be immunized against Neisseria uh, at least two weeks before starting it. Um, and we've had no incident of anyone developing Neisseria meningitides uh, during the trial, though it has been reported in some of the other trials that they're conducting. 
we break out what the adverse events were, um, you can see them here, slightly more frequent, but not statistically so, uh, with some nausea, some back pain, nasopharyngitis, minor aches, headache, cough, um, not serious, and none of these were severe that warranted termination of the individual from the study or the patient asked to be terminated. So in this phase two trial, 86% of the patients achieve the primary endpoint. 57% um, had a huge improvement in their QMG of at least eight points. Um, the three-point reduction in QMG was noted within the first three weeks of therapy. Um, median time, 12 days. Uh, they also had improvement in the MGADL score. Uh, statistical significance uh, was achieved with these. And safety uh, was, was quite good. And so in conclusions for the pilot study, um, the, and it's only 14 patients, uh, was that complement may be efficacious in refractory myasthenia. Uh, eculizumab, which is uh, the name, of, uh, the generic name of the compound, uh, is safe and well tolerated. Um, and I think further shows that uncontrolled complement activation continues to play a role in the development and the refractory nature uh, of myasthenia <coughs> and represents a potential new first-in-class kind of therapy uh, for, for MG. So what's the future? We're in the midst of a phase three FDA pivotal and EU pivotal trial uh, that's underway on five continents with the goal of recruiting 92 patients uh, and recruitment is going well. Um, folks here in Seattle are part of that study um, you've got one in one enrolled, possibly a second coming down. Um, this criteria for entry are similar, with the exception that we now allow the use of plasma exchange and IVIG up to within a month of randomization. And making that change has improved our ability to recruit. This was just an absolutely horrific trial to recruit for. Um, and so this is currently underway. Um, there are roughly about 45, 48 patients currently under therapy uh, in this trial right now. So what are the questions? Is this or could this be a disease-modifying therapy? Should we administer it early? We know that complement destruction occurs early. And do you use this in combination with other things to shut down not only the immune-mediated attack to the junction but also the complement destruction of that postjunctional membrane. What's the role as rescue therapy? With some of these patients getting better within one dose, and complement inhibition occurs within 24 hours. Within 24 hours, there's total inhibition of complement. Um, and then with doing nothing else after a single dose, complement activity is in back. Uh, within uh, 48 hours, 72 hours. And so is there a role of using this as rescue therapy? The patient who rolls in in crisis, goes to the ICU, is intubated, they have terrible veins, uh, they're a vascular path with diabetes and coronary artery disease and stroke and you don't want to give them IVIG, could this be a way to rescue these folks? Um, it remains to be seen. Currently, it's an every two week dosing schedule after one month of induction therapy. Is that a proper dosing? This carryover effect that we saw was totally unexpected and we're not sure what's going on. My own personal belief is that we are remodeling the neuromuscular junction. New receptors are being put to the surface and as a result of that, we've restored the membrane to a degree um, with increased numbers of, of receptor complexes there under the nerve terminal. And maybe we don't need every two week uh, dosing. Maybe we can go three weeks or four weeks um, and, and cut down costs and hassles, uh, etc. Um, 
So like any piece of research, once we start, um, the questions literally abound um, beyond this. So the phase three trial is currently underway, uh, 301, and then we have an extension trial that may go as long as four years. Um, here we are with our two to four week screening process, and as I said, we can use plasma exchange up into the point of randomization, and then uh, folks are randomized either to active drug or to placebo. Recognizing that those who go on placebo and who have been receiving plasma exchange or IVIG may have exacerbations of their disease, we have built in rescue therapy that can be used to reverse the process and allow them to continue in the drug or in the trial until the end of, of 26 weeks. Those who complete the 26 weeks then have the option of going into an open label up to four years of, of receiving drugs during which we'll collect safety data uh, and long-term uh, effects. So we're halfway there. Uh, we've got a ways to go and hopefully we can recruit more uh, here. Here are our study centers um, and they span all of these continents. We have them out in Russia and South Korea and Japan um, and Scandinavia. Um, and the highest density, of course, is here in the States. Let me show you a case that we always show the best case. So this was a fellow who at age 26, this was Vern Jules' patient, at age 26 develops acute ocular weakness. He has rapid progression to bulbar generalized weakness. He's antibody positive. Um, he had no decrement to rep stem in the trap in the nasalis, but abnormal single fiber EMG. So he started on cholinesterase inhibitors that give him partial improvement. He's then placed on a mg per kilogram per day of a high dose prednisone uh, and then tapered, which he takes for several years. Uh, that he didn't have any kind of a response to. He undergoes a thymectomy shortly after diagnosis um, and doesn't respond to that. And I can't remember whether Vern said he had hyperplasia, excuse me, in the gland or not. He's treated for his severe exacerbations with frequent plasma exchange, and then he dwindles down, and so Vern treated him almost annually with a course of plasma exchange to boost him. Um, IVIG didn't do a thing for him. He received azathioprine for six months. That may have been too short. Uh, that didn't improve him. He gets cyclosporin um, initially at modest dose and then tapered. Uh, he gets some improvement, <coughs> but clearly it's not a slam dunk. And then he's treated with mycophenolate mofetil, um, and he has no improvement whatsoever. So refractory without question. This guy in 2009, 2010, when he was in the study, was essentially homebound. He could not climb stairs. He could not drive a car. And he could do his own activities of daily living but for the most part was a prisoner within his house unless someone took him out to go somewhere because he could not do it independently. Here are his clinical metrics. Um, and we're looking at QMG here in blue, his ADL score here in red, <laughs> his um, MMT manual muscle testing here in purple, and his quality of life instrument here in green. Here is his screening period. He receives placebo in the first arm of the crossover trial. He then undergoes a washout and then receives eculizumab. And everything normalizes. Jitter studies have been done for over 20 years on this guy serially. And they range from about 150 to 250 until he got here, 
and they drop to 35. And then at the termination of the study, there was no drug to give him, and everything slowly moved back. He's now being treated with rituximab um, with partial uh, improvement, and Vern's applying for a compassionate use. Could I ask you about that? Hang on one sec. So in this time frame here, he went out and cleared a half acre of trees and went golfing for the first time in 30 years and shot pretty well. So a remarkable response to someone who's had disease for so long that one would think hey, there's nothing going to work here. This can't be helpful at all. Your question? What do you make of the placebo business? We saw it in your other graphs too. So my own feeling is that if you're seeing me virtually every week and I'm paying attention to you, you give me extra effort and um, you do better. I think we see this in a number of our trials. And so that's always, a, always an issue. Chip, uh, how long did this patient um, have this degree of improvement before they were starting to decline again? Almost a year, but he was losing ground slowly. He was on um, no other treatment at the time? He was on mycophenolate um, um, and some prednisone, I think, Vern put him back on. Yeah. So I think complement needs to be addressed. Uh, not only in MG, but I think there are a number of other complement disorders, NMO for instance. It's being tried in acute transplant rejection at the moment. Um, we learned the lesson with HUS and PNH as it being very effective. And I think MG is going to be the next one. Um, and then the real questions come up, how do we use this? Where is its niche and its role? It's the most expensive drug on the market right now. It's about a half a million a year. Uh, for therapy, um, and hopefully that will change. Um, so it's not for everybody without any stretch of the imagination. But there are selected patients in whom complement has really buggered up their end plate that this may play a role. My question is, should everybody be treated for a short period early in the disease and see if we can gain control of the whole system, um, first by repairing what's done, then shutting down the immune attack, because complement's not activated until you cross-link receptors with antibody. And so if we can gain a hold early, we may be able to preserve the neuromuscular junction in these folks. They used to talk about the myasthenic myopathy, but Roland, and these are people who had not, this is prior to prednisones of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I've seen one whose myasthenic destruction, if you will, was so bad, they had profound atrophy and they couldn't hold their head up. And she, if her head fell down, she had to lift it to get it back up because she had no muscle mass to, to do it, which I think is membrane destruction. So let me stop. Let me answer any questions that anyone has. Yes. So central to the question, or I think this is from the director, I think it's what we know about the uh, neuromuscular junction. And there are always these great slides of the simplified membrane and it looks terrible. But what do we know about what happens next? I mean, your results argue that things happen very quickly. I think it's understood that it happens quickly to last for a while. But what do we actually know about how quickly it happens? Well, it's not been. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So the question is, what's happening, if I'm understanding it correctly, that we know how this has worked, the rapidity with which it works, but what else is going on in terms of restoration, if you will, of the neuromuscular junction? And what do we know about how effective that is in anybody with Yeah, and how effective is it in anyone with the disease? We don't really know. I mean, no one has been able to do the kinds of studies that need to be done. There was talk at one point of using PET scanning with a specific isotope that labeled receptors 
and could you gain a hold that way? And that's all petered out. It was coming out of Canada. Uh, Catsburg, I think, uh, Toronto was the one involved. So we, we, we don't know. So I was wondering the same thing. I was, was really impressed with how, how quickly and how effectively it was done. And it seems like that's a bit quick for sort of this remodeling and the bigger, the bigger demands to be done. Uh, well, remember that receptor, the question is, it seems too quick to right. repair. So then I'm wondering, so the, the pictures you showed was histology of mice. Has anyone given mice and seen them get better? And, and so the question is, has anyone done it in mice and looked at uh, histopathology? No, not yet. It's being planned, um, but it's not been looked at yet. It's a critical piece of the puzzle. Mike, that's re it was really nice talk that you gave. Um, my question was, do you think there's a role? I know there's not a role, likely a role for the use of eculizumab in Mosk antibody positive patients because they don't have a complement to that position. How about the sort of negative mycoplanus? So the question is, what's the role in seronegative in musk myasthenia? We know in musk uh, it's not complement dependent. Um, and there's virtually little complement activity at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, in these people that uh, have been biopsied. The seronegative, I think, is still uh, a question mark. We know the new antibody is LRP4. We don't know the phenotype of that disease yet. And um, we have little specifics at this time. Stay tuned in a year, and we may know, because um, we're going to start to look at it with Jeff Guptill at Duke. Um, and look at their immune profiles. Um, but these are, you know, what about the Titan antibody? What about the Agarin antibody patient? And, and we just don't have enough of these folks yet, and none of them have been studied adequately to know is there a complement there? So that's a question mark. Other questions? There may be some questions from M the other hospitals. I'm not sure I remember exactly how to do this. I think if you minimize, um, oops, I think that you go back into, yeah, into there. No, I guess there aren't any. Okay. Well, thanks again. That was great. Oh, you're welcome.